Southern Kaduna has been experiencing a fresh wave of killings in recent times. Senator Ahmed Mohamed McCarthy, a former governor of Kaduna State, has spoken on the events, saying that the news of a resurgent wave of attacks and violence leading to loss of lives of innocent people around the Jema Akaura Zangon Kataf local government axis of Kaduna State was horrible and as horrible and obnoxious and unacceptable. Also, the state government has stated that the death toll in Sunday's attack in Kaura local government area has risen to 34, including two military personnel. Now, joining us to discuss these unfortunate events is Joseph Hayab. He's a, a priest, a clergyman rather, and the Kaduna State Chairman of the Christian Association of Nigeria. Uh, Reverend Hayab, good evening to you. Thanks for your time. Reverend Joseph Hayab, can you hear me, please? Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you very much for having me this evening. Interesting. Uh, uh, we, we've had a wave of, of attacks and killings um, in, in Kaduna State. The last one we hear in places like uh, Kaura local government area. You know, also before that, we had about Zango Kataf. Um, and the latest figure we hear between 34 and 37 uh, bodies being recovered, including uh, uh, two military personnel. It was 34 before uh, we were told a mob attacked three persons and killed them in uh, a headers camp. What exactly is, is this wave of attacks this time in southern Kaduna all about, the recent one? Yeah, well, uh, before I actually respond to your question, let me correct that. There was no mob attack and killing of any herder because the government spokesperson or the commissioner of security who issued that statement realized that it was a mere propaganda from his office because there was nothing like that. And he has also issued another statement to retract that because there was nothing like that. The killing was in Kaguru, in Kafanchan, and in Kaura where innocent citizens who had no business with anybody than just trying to live their lives were attacked, killed. Over or almost 200 houses were burned. Over 37 people were killed, including women, young children, older people. What an unfortunate situation. Hmm. All right. Uh, uh, Reverend, this, this, this latest wave of attacks, so what would you say is behind this? I mean, you're chairman of the Christian Association of Nigeria, and a body that has been active you know, in terms of uh, uh, talking and speaking out against the violence in Kaduna State. What is behind this latest attack? Well, there's really nothing latest. It's just a continuation of what has been going on for a long time. I think the bandits have find Kaduna a suitable ground, a suitable fertile soil for them to carry out their barbaric act. And so they move from one community to the other, and Southern Kaduna seems to be receiving the largest share of the attack. They move from Zangun Kataf. The next day they will go to Kaura, another week they will go to Jama, another week they will go to other uh, Kachia, and so on. The fact is that within the last six days, there were so much attack around. But this one became very famous because lives were lost. But in Kachia local government alone, around over 49 people were kidnapped, and about six to five people were killed. And nobody talked about it. Then on Sunday, this unfortunate incident happened. The Southern Kaduna one has become a victim of a conspiracy that we cannot define and we cannot explain why. Why will this bandit every day come and attack innocent citizens? Why will this bandit every day come and attack people in their homes? And you know, we always come forward and make some argument that this is the hardest farmers clashes. I cannot even understand what it means when you say it is the hardest farmers clashes. Because someone is sleeping in his house, someone has no business with farm, even with Hadin, and criminals walked into his community kill him, burnt his house, and you call that, you call that farmers had us. But that's the kind of term that they find it suitable to use and confuse people instead of dealing headlong with criminals who are attacking people in their homes, who are destroying livelihood, who are even making citizens of Nigeria not sleeping in their homes. Because there was a time our governor came out to tell the world that these criminals and these uh, bandits are foreigners. He even told the world that he went out there and paid them money. What are we seeing now? Probably the money he paid them has finished and they need new money. You can see the implication of paying money to criminals. That's why when he came back again and started changing his tune and telling the world that he's not going to negotiate with bandits, 
we find that to be pure politics because you were the ones who said there was no other option than to give them money. You've given them money, they've enjoyed the money, they've become rich, they've bought more weapons, they now want to operate with their weapons, and you're telling them that there will be no deal, no way. And I believe that's why the criminals and the bandits are refusing to leave Kaduna because they have found our state a fertile ground for them to continue to do their evil. And they know that 98% of what our governor said is purely rhetoric and there will be no action. Uh, uh, we've talked about uh, Kaduna um, over the past few years um, a lot. The, the governor of Kaduna State, Nasser Arafat, who you've just talked about, uh, recently said, you know, the, the killing is, is, is become more than the, the uh, Boko Haram and terrorism in the North East. So he has called the government to also look at the Northwest as well. And um, it's become more prominent than even Boko Haram attacks. You've talked about criminals, you've talked about bandits. Who exactly are these people? Where do they come from? And what is their motive? Yeah, well, you see, these bandits are out to actually destroy source of livelihood in the whole of Kaduna State. Because even yesterday night, they were in Giwa local government. The fact that in Igiwa they kidnapped a priest, they killed three of our brothers, they destroyed their homes, over 10 houses, they killed many other people in Igiwa just yesterday, just yesterday. But you see, one of the reasons why Southern Katuna becomes more on the news is because once such killings happen in other parts, the language the government will use in defining the killing becomes different with the language you will use in defining the killing when it comes to Southern Kaduna. So people find that to be very hypocritical because a responsible government supposed to be fair, supposed to be honest, supposed to protect every citizen irrespective of his identity. A responsible government should not begin to protect or speak favorably for criminals. But what we find in Kaduna today is our government, Killings are going on everywhere because it would be wrong for anybody to assume that every all the killings are in Southern Kaduna. But once it happens in Southern Kaduna, the language the government use is not a language of good. Hi there, Reverend Joseph Hayab. Can you please hear us? All right. Yeah, uh, I can hear you. Okay, yes. So continue. We, we can hear you. Continue, please. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with yes, you. Yes, yes. So, so um, um, uh, of course, the, the, the killings in Kaduna are well documented. In fact, the, uh, the governor of, of, of Kaduna said, Nasser Arafai, they talk about, you know, like I said earlier, the, the, the statistics of, of killings in the south and northwestern part of the country. But we've been hearing uh, two particular local government areas uh, as being prominent, you know, in, 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 in all of this. Um, hundreds of lives lost since. 2020, 2021, and now we're talking about 2022. I'm referring to Kaura and Zango Kataf local government areas. Um, um, why is it that with, with this particular local government areas, it's not been possible to have uh, a solution, even if it's a military solution, to, yeah. to secure them, knowing that these are red areas? Yeah, that is what we expect government to do. If a governor realizes that a particular area is prone to danger, is prone to crisis, is being attacked, then steps must be taken to secure that area, to protect that area. The governor knows very well that the bandits are terrorizing the people of Zongo Katab, they are terrorizing the people of Kaura, they are terrorizing the people of Jamal local government, they are terrorizing the larger part of Southern Kaduna. But you see, there is no concrete effort. We've heard that they put a military, a, a mobile police station. It will interest you to know that that particular community in Kaguru that was attacked last Sunday is not up to 10 minutes or five minutes drive from where the mobile police are. So you ask yourself, what was, what did they put the mobile police there for? There was a time the chief of army staff or the chief of air staff told us that they are going to start an air force barracks there. All these are rhetoric. They come to the media every day and sing songs of things they are never going to do. So Nigerians will just assume that all is well in Southern Kaduna only to hear the next day that there is an attack. And when uh, innocent uh, Southern Kaduna people hear this good news and think that, oh, they they are bringing security uh, forces around us and they go to sleep and the enemy will come again and attack them. That's why we are so disturbed that why should government 
specializes in telling lies, specializes in propaganda, specializing in misleading our people, and she's not protecting them. This is unfair. These are citizens. These citizens voted for you, even if they do not vote for you, for the mere fact that you took out of office to defend the lives and protect lives and properties of the citizens. It is about the citizens of the state. Mm. Why should you allow some part of the state to suffer and every day they are busy burying loved ones? The other day I attended a burial in Southern Kaduna where we buried 38 people in one burial service. What kind of life is that? Yeah, How uh, can uh, such people be productive? Yeah, Re Reverend Hayab, I'm also hearing that uh, today, it's been in the news, um, in the last few minutes, I must say, um, that uh, about 50 people have been... Uh, have lost their lives, and we're going to try and get some clarity on this story. In, in Giwa, local government area of Kaduna State, uh, we're hearing bandits attacked nine communities. Um, uh, have you heard anything like that? I think you did mention something. If you had listened to me earlier, yes, earlier yeah. I, I, I did share with our viewers to know that we are aware of the story of the killing in Giwa because the Christian community there have reported to us how their homes were burned. Yeah, Giwa has also been in the news in the past uh, few months. Yeah. Virtually every week, an attack will happen in Giwa. So completely what I would say is that there is a failure of governance. That is why Kaduna State is always on the news for bad reason. Always on the news because lives are being lost. But, but pre pre President Mohamed Buhari, of course, uh, Aerofi, governor of Kaduna State, is a governor. He's not a president and he has a limit to what he can do. Uh, you might want to argue with that, but, but he has previously appealed to the president to do something about the situation in Kaduna State. And, and, and uh, the Human Rights Writers uh, 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 group is, is saying, Huriwa, is, is also saying that um, uh, President Buhari is doing nothing basically about the situation. Um, he, they've called it a reluctance to stop the killings in Kaduna State and petitioned the UK and the EU over what they call Buhari's reluctance. Uh, would you say President Buhari is reluctant to stop the killings in Kaduna State, and can he possibly do more than it's been done right now? I believe those who are advising President Buhari have given him a narrative that is quite one-sided, a narrative that is selfish, a narrative that does not show consign to the lives that have been lost. Did you even read the press statement released from presidency about the killing in Southern Kaduna? It's quite sad. How can citizens of your country be killed and you make such release as if it is a reprisal attack? And how are people sleeping in their house and someone come and kill them and all you say is that you're warning against reprisal attack? That's to tell you that the president is being fed with wrong information. The president is not properly advised. And if he is fully aware and is passing instructions, then his instructions are not being carried out because killings continue every day in Southern Kaduna. Sometimes we are so tired and weak to keep coming over and over to be crying that there is killing, there is killing. When we talk about killing, we are talking about killings of human beings. We are not talking about religion, uh, just about a, a tribal group or a, a faith group. We are talking about killings of human beings. These people are Nigerians. They are citizens of this country. All right. All, 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 all right. Uh, Reverend, government. we have to go. We have to go. But indeed, President Buhari in that press statement condemned the killings and he said that, um, uh, quote, mindless act of violence has no place in the civilized society. So he did, he called it a cowardly attack on innocent civilians. So we also need to point that out. But uh, I want to thank yeah, you. Yeah, he yes. did, but some of the words he added to, you see, when you are talking about people who are crying, you have to be careful with we your have, words. If we you have to go. Words that, yeah, thank you. We have to go. I want to thank you very much, sir. I think your point has been passed. Uh, Reverend Joseph Hayab is the chairman of the Christian Association of Nigeria in Kaduna State, and he's been a guest uh, on Plus Politics. Thank you for staying with us. We round up today's show with the weekly highlights of the show. I'm Kofi Patels. Plus Politics returns on Monday. The feeling of the house and the feeling of most people who have read the judgment is that uh, it's a judgment that smacks of what people have been complaining about in the Nigerian political system. Mainly that uh, politicians are trying to bring the judiciary into disrepute. There is no reason whatsoever for the court, for instance, to enter into, to, to accept that case the way it was accepted to give an order against a party that was not uh, a party to the suit, 
and to order further that the, the that the executive should perform the duties of the legislature by going to delete a section of the electoral act what the honorable court should have done or should have stopped that would have been simply to uh, say in his opinion that the said section of the constitution was null and void to the extent of its inconsistency to a specific section of the constitution the later judgment by the state high court is actually very sad and unfortunate and uh, clearly shows that um, we still have a lot of work to do with our judiciary because both the state high court and the federal high court are cause of um, coordinate jurisdiction they are in the same level they are on the same pedestal so it is sad that on same issues same parties these cases were going on simultaneously i, I don't know what really happened uh, a situation where immediately the federal high court abuja gave judgment the state high court which obviously given the circumstance and from my experience uh, seems to be a judgment in flint i think njc and the nigerian Bar association has a lot of work to do to ensure that corrupt judges uh, do not in fact these days at the federal high court when you're filing any suit uh, you will have to depose an affidavit that uh, uh, there is no other suit and you're not going to duplicate suits. So, obviously, what happened in the Boeing State High Court is uh, a misnomer, and NJC should meet out the appropriate sanctions on uh, the offending judge. I will say that uh, EFCC does not have the capacity to, to deal with this type of crime. Because over time we have seen not one, not three, not ten, not fifteen. It has become like a normal thing for EFCC. Once uh, a public officer exhausts or the tenor expires, the next thing EFCC suits on on him and is uh, possibly arrested, kept for a few days, take to court, granted bail. The politician comes back to to the society and never allows the society to rest with the enormous money that they have paid for or fleeced from from the government treasury. And uh, for contesting for this position for the past uh, 1993 up to this time that we are talking of about 29 years ago. So by next year it's going to be 30 years that Atiku Abubakar has been running for this position. The question now is. Has it always been uh, uh, um, been revealing his uh, political uh, manifesto? I did the same thing that he has been talking about. Has he been able to upgrade himself? And another question that we have is looking at his age. By this time next year, um, by the time we we'll be contest the election next year, Atiku Abubakar will be about seventy-six years of age. If I'm not wrong, yeah, which about seventy-six years of age. So at seventy-six. With looking at the antecedent of uh, the present uh, president who came in at 75 or 76 too, looking at the age and what is happening under him, we remember how this man spent more than one year outside Nigeria for medical attention. Because at that age, there are a lot of things that happens to people who are over 70 years, medical attention. So, will the man be able to deliver at 76?